Hello, everyone. I'm Ted Oakley, Managing Partner at Oxbow, and really happy to have today James Ferguson, who is one of the managing partners and co-founder of um, Macro Strategy. And we're having James from uh, across the pond in England. James, glad to have you today. Hello, glad to be here. James has done a great work uh, that I haven't seen from anybody else that's this good, but he did a great piece called the U.S. Deficit Funded End Game. And one of the things that I know everybody intuitively in the country knows is that it can't go on this way with debt growing faster than GDP, et cetera. But James is going to lead us through some of that today and give us his points. But James, we'll let you take it from there. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for, for your kind intro. Um, if I'm going to give the plot away right from the very beginning, just so that um, that helps everyone track what's happening, um, the, the, the issue is that the, uh, the Treasury has been issuing the debt in order to fund the growth. If we subtract that debt from nominal GDP, even nominal GDP is negative. So we, as you said in your intro, we, we know this is wrong and is unsustainable. We just don't really know how the unsustainability ends. And this um, presentation, I hope, will, will show you that the way it ends is because the money that's been used to fund this debt had been previously issued during COVID. Uh, this was the excess savings that the Fed talks about but doesn't really track. Uh, and this excess savings mainly found its way into money market funds. The money market funds mainly put this money into the reverse repo at the Fed. And um, Treasury's been drawing on this. But the problem is that when it finishes drawing on this, that slush fund is over. And the really big point about this is that when that slush fund is over, all other debt that the Treasury raises will have to come from somewhere else. It's no longer a free lunch. It will now have to come from, say, um, investors who are buying T-bills, but it'll have to come out of their bank accounts, which they might have used to spend or invest, and go into the Treasury's bank account where it decides how to spend or invest it. And so that's the really important crutch point that we're discussing is when does the excess free money that was printed during COVID run out? Because after that, you no longer get uh, the free lunch of uh, Treasury deficit funded um, growth, um, not coming at the expense of 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 somewhere else uh, having to pay for it. So if we um, if we start out at the beginning of this story, this whole story of, of course starts with COVID and with the policy decisions uh, made during COVID in terms of uh, uh, printing money and, and handing it out to everybody to bribe them to stay at home uh, and not go out and drink Budweiser. So if we look at the um, the velocity of money, um, the velocity of money is quite an important point from a technical point of view because. The Keynesian theory that is beloved of the Fed and, and the other central bankers, it's not just the Fed, um, states that uh, money created by the monetary authorities cannot and does not find its way back into the real economy. That means that the collapse of velocity, which purely measures the relationship of money and nominal GDP, um, doesn't bounce back. So the first slide that I'm, I'm looking at, um, or that I presented here, is a First time, so this is like a true definition of uh, of um, velocity. So I'm using the flow of funds data to establish what money supply is, because the uh, the Fed doesn't publish M3 any longer, and even when it did, it includes money market funds, which is fine. Um, clearly, the people who have money in money market funds think of that as being their money, but the trouble is, it causes double counting, because if the money market fund then uses that those funds to buy T bills. Then the Treasury spends that money by, say, paying federal employees' wages, and it goes into their bank accounts. So now we have money in both the federal employees' bank accounts and in the money market funds, and it's the same money. So we're double counting. Uh, the Bank of England, to get around this, doesn't include money market funds at all in its measure of um, money supply, for example. So this first chart shows uh, broad money supply. Unfortunately, this some of the flow of funds data doesn't go back any further than this. So this is the longest we can look at. But you can see that the, the, um, the velocity of money is on, a, as Milton Friedman predicted, a sort of steady, fairly unvolatile downtrend. Gets very volatile when they print lots of money. We now have much more money than GDP. Um, so temporarily, the velocity uh, dives. And then it does what they didn't expect, which is come back uh, to trend. And because the velocity of money is coming back to trend, and we'll look through a few more slides and see that it looks like it is almost back at trend, that means that free lunch period is over and we go back to 
more normal rules of engagement. And you know, uh, James, for all those people out there that I don't know as much about terminology, when we're talking about velocity, we're talking about turnover. Uh, you know, and and I think that's that they they'll realize the more you turn something over, uh, the more active it becomes. But I personally believe that velocity might be a very unfortunate word. I mean, this dates back to the thirties. This concept of the relationship between the amount of money in the economy and the size of the economy, uh, and using velocity kind of makes sense then, because you sort of say, "Oh, how fast is this money turning around, churning around, and going through the economy in any particular year?" But it's really something much more simple than that. It is just the ratio of the amount of money to GDP. And if you increase the amount of money, then GDP has to go up until we're back in balance. But because it can't make things happen in, in a real sense, only nominal GDP goes up and only the nominal part of that, which is inflation. So this really explains you know, why we had inflation. If you print lots of money, we have more money than we, we required to do the same amount of stuff. And the only way to redress the balance is to change the price of the stuff, uh, which is inflation. So this firstly tells you, being back in balance, velocity tells you that the pressures for higher inflation are, have dissipated. Inflation is always a lagging indicator. It takes some time to fall out of the system. But you can see at the rate that it's slowing down that it, it's, it's falling out. Uh, and it would fall out faster if the Fed didn't have such a rubbish way of measuring shelter, but that's another issue. Um, and uh, But it also tells us that um, the idea that putting money into the economy wouldn't be inflationary is wrong, and also that when that money is being redeployed, we lose that, that, that change. So if you have a look at, um, you know, CPI, uh, for example, um, you know, basically rent has been keeping CPI high, uh, but it's coming down. Um, the rent, uh, the new tenant index for rent uh, is is almost back on its old trend. But the really important one, the, if, even economists seem to misunderstand this, is the owner's equivalent rent. I won't go into too much boring detail, but um, there are two rent components in CPI. Uh, one of them is a, a quarter of the shelter component. That's rent, as you and I understand it. But the big one, three quarters of the shelter component, is owner's equivalent rent, which is the Fed's very weird and clumsy and delayed way of trying to, to uh, account for the increase in house prices. But this is clumsy and unnecessary because we already have other ways of measuring the increase in house prices. Um, but if you look at the difference between the increase in house prices and owner's equivalent rent, you can see why owner's equivalent rent is, is such a big lag to um, house prices and why, therefore, we're going to get um, overly high numbers for both rent and owner's equivalent rent. Uh, in the CPI data. And this keeps the CPI data high longer than necessary. If we strip out the shelter component, um, then, you know, a few times, normally they track, but a few times in the past when shelter has been lagging and staying high after um, CPI less shelter has been falling quite a long way, um, we see that um, that usually is a precursor to quite sharp declines in CPI. So That's lots of people are talking about sticky I'm CPI. I'm with you there on owner's equivalent because of all the things that the Fed puts out, uh, I think that's probably the most the, the most misunderstood of anything out there. And so what difference does it make if your house price gets rented at a certain level because you're not going to rent it anyway? So uh, it's interesting how they confuse people with both of these, but uh, you've made a point on that. Well, also they survey people about how much they could rent their house for. Now, if there's one thing that a homeowner is blissfully ignorant of is how much they could rent their house for. <laughs> so, you know, you've built in an enormous sort of ignorance lag here that, that basically makes people go, oh, I don't know. <laughs> um, and so these, these numbers sort of come out way behind particularly big shifts uh, and take a long time to, to, you know, for that data to catch up with what's happening on the ground. So if you look at CPI um, less shelter, that's been trending at way below the Fed's target of 2% now for 10, 11 months. Um, you know, if, if, if CPI was properly measured, we wouldn't be talking about inflation at all. But that is an interesting point. We'd probably be talking now about the risks of deflation. Because once you've used up all the excess money that was printed during COVID, there comes a moment when um, you might start to, uh, to run out of steam. CPI is already, even if we include shelter, is running at about sort of three percent of an annualized rate, which is nothing to get too panicky about when you're targeting two percent. Take shelter out, and as I said, it's well below that. So, um, what is happening with this excess money? Can how can we measure this excess money and compare it to nominal GDP? 
Um, and if you do your best guess at that, because it is more art than science, probably, um, you have to sort of see how much money did the economy seem to need before COVID and how close are we to closing that the, the jaws of the alligator and, and closing that off uh, now. And we're getting very close in the US. We, had, we did have an uptick in January, but that seems largely to be due to seasonal factors because firms um, fill up all their uh, bank accounts in December, January, ahead of having to pay their annual taxes. And then the, the money flows back out again um, sort of uh, in sort of February, March. And then households do the same thing again in April. Um, but at the moment, we're on track, give or take, um, for the excess money supply to run out around about May. And this is important because this is the same month that the um, the require uh, the reverse repo, um, which is basically the banks and the money market funds deposit account at the Fed, uh, when that also kind of runs out of money. Um, if you want to know what happens after that happens, well, when when basically um, the money supply, having been well above nominal GDP, crosses below it, well, we've already seen that in Europe. So in Europe, you've already seen, and the UK. You've already seen money supply um, earlier in the year, sort of around about the end of the first half uh, of 2023, they came back into balance. And then money supply continued to uh, contract because everyone's doing QT. Uh, and they've also got interest rates too high. So the banks aren't creating money by lending and the, and the central banks are retiring money via QT. So this means we're getting a nominal contraction of, of money supply, which doesn't normally happen. Well, it doesn't normally happen ever. Um, it's a it's a feature of of depressions and uh, big, big big boy recessions. Um, but as you can see in in Europe, um, we already have had money supply fall below nominal GDP, which is giving us uh, a nominal GDP that's technically not in recession. I think it's like it's um, zero point one percent annualized GDP number in it. And in the UK, we actually have two back to back quarters of uh, of decline. So. Um, what we're looking at here is, is a recession. Now, if you talk about recession in the US right now, everybody thinks you're mad because we're talking about shooting the lights out, not, not recessions. But this is what happens when you're using up the last of the free money. Um, and, uh, and particularly if you're using that money to fund uh, a government deficit that is you know, akin to, to um, building pyramids. It looks a lot like it, it, it counts as GDP growth in the current quarter, even if it's going to give you nothing even if it's basically destroying wealth. Uh, and that's really the problem is you, you're window dressing the economy using the, the last vestiges of the printed money. Um, and then we're going to have to pay the piper come around about sometime in quarter two. And those two charts uh, basically just show that, that, the, that the UK is, is obviously, uh, Europe is, head of, uh, is ahead of the US in terms of that crossover. And we're close. I guess we're within three months or something like that. But uh, uh, those are two interesting charts to look at. Well, in the, in Europe, the um, there, there are sort of tentative um, lap dogs for the for the Fed. So the Fed did went mad <laughs> and increased raw money supply by forty percent. I mean, you know, as an as experiments go, that that's a biggie. In Europe, they didn't really have the nerve to do that. They didn't really understand necessarily the uh, well they definitely didn't understand the implications and possibly didn't understand the fed's reasoning so they increased uh, money supply by 20 percent pretty much uh, i think the ecb and the uk both it was about 20 percent um so they've used up the money sooner because they printed relatively speaking less of it uh and therefore the nominal gd and the inflation was certainly um no lower in fact in many cases it was higher uh in europe and the uk therefore the nominal gdp close the gap faster. So therefore, you've, you've, on both sides, you've, you've had the uh, um, the money supply and the nominal GDP closing. And uh, yes, not often you get the uh, the luxury of being able to look somewhere else and, and instead of wondering what might happen, actually observe it and go, oh, that's what will happen. And I think you're absolutely right. The US is in a, in a very good position because they can look across the Atlantic and say, oh, we're, we're about to do that. And that's the consequence. The consequence is, you know, Germany has fallen off its horse in a really dramatic and, and terrifying manner. The UK is, you know, is stressing. I mean, you know, the incumbent uh, political party reckon they're going to get annihilated in the uh, in the next elections. Um, you know, it's really having, and it, and we've seen a massive rise of, of sort of you know uh, populist parties across Europe. So the European Central 
office in Brussels is, is extremely worried about the rise of Eurosceptic uh, parties right the way across the, uh, the Eurozone. So it's, um, these things have a, have a big impact. Mismanage the economy at your, uh, at your peril. Yeah, I just saw where uh, Portugal was in Wall Street today, actually, where Portugal was leaning now toward uh, populist, more of a right, right, right handed type of government people coming in. I think I believe it was Portugal this morning. But it's all, well, I mean, you know, I, I don't think the populations are probably really, you know, interested in the right or left wing designation. But they are aware of the fact that the powers that be said, don't worry about it. Trust us, we'll manage things. Then they got very irresponsible with money and with uh, with COVID type policies, and gave everybody a free lunch. And everybody was worried about what the consequences of that would be. And it turned out they were they were told not to worry about inflation. And then if we had inflation, they said, "Well, don't worry, it won't last." And then you know it, it not only lasted, it it continued to get even worse. And so um, I think there's been a, a big break, a big loss of trust um, that that the authorities actually know what they're doing. In fact. Bank of England is currently being investigated by your own um, uh, Bernanke, uh, who is checking to see uh, what, what went wrong with their forecast. I mean, there's, there's a very straightforward answer to what went wrong with their forecast. They neglected all of the lessons that Milton Friedman had, uh, had taught them. But I don't think Bernanke is the man to, uh, to reinstitute militarism somehow. So uh, I don't know what he's going to come up with. Well, I'm going to pay you a compliment, James, and you don't even know this, but I watched an interview with you just a little over three years ago when everyone was saying transitory inflation, et cetera, et cetera. And you were, you were really hard line on, hey, no, this is going to cause inflation when you throw this much money out. You ended up being exactly right when everybody else thought, uh, hey, it's just a little small thing, it'll go away. But uh, I have to give you a check mark on that one because you were right on the money. Well, thank you very much. You know what they say about the stock clock, but anyway. <laughs> Now, I mean, you know, I, 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 I do strongly believe that, um, that a kind of collective madness has overtaken the worlds of academe and central banking. And it's, it's, they don't like monetarism and they prefer Keynesianism because Keynesianism um, appeals to their politics. But really, when you're, when you're doing economics, you've got to put politics to the side and, and concentrate on the things that work. And, and their argument that monetarism doesn't work doesn't bear any scrutiny. Uh, historically, um, and uh, you know they they uh, they willfully ignored the lessons that that could go all the way back to uh, to Roman times about debauching the currency, uh, and you know even Keynes alleged alleged that uh, Lenin said that the best way to destroy the capitalist system was to debauch the currency, and that's what these guys have done, and and they well. It's and I would say this for most people out there that don't understand as much about Keynesianism and Milton Friedman monetarists. Uh, what it really boils down to, I think you would say this too, is you have to control the money supply in order to control the inflation. Uh, bottom line, you know. Well, I, I mean, some of the more hardline monetarists um, and maybe Austrians as well would would say this that that actually the inflation is a symptom. The money supply is the cause. So by the time you've inflated the money supply, you've already created inflation. It's just not in the data yet because when we're measuring the data, we look at things. A lot of sticky prices only shift or change once a year, and we're looking at things compared to a year ago. So it just takes some time for that to get into the system. What's really interesting today is that exactly the same rules also apply in reverse. So if we've now been running a, a negative trend on money supply, uh, even if we um, include uh, the reverse repo, um, then we're, we're basically sort of saying that that, that uh, bubble of money supply that was printed um, is in a downward trend, and that downward trend will cross over with nominal. It's been on a downward trend for, you know, 18 months or so, and it will cross over with nominal GDP quite soon um, in the next, possibly even the next sort of three or four months. Uh, but when that happens, we go from an inflationary environment to a deflationary one, just as they have in Europe. And this is the, uh, this is the, the, you know, just if no one could believe we would have inflation last time around because we hadn't had it for 40 years. So it just sort of seemed like something that wasn't really an issue. Um, no one's thinking we can have deflation now because they're still talking about sticky inflation. But when you're looking at something that's lagging by at least 12 months, that's a, that's a foolish place to be looking. You should be looking at things which are at least coincident indicators and if not preferably leading indicators.
And this also brings us, I, I should say, to the really the, the crux of the matter, which is why hasn't a, a contraction of money supply caused any of this deflationary pressure yet? I think that's a very legitimate uh, question to raise. Um, and, the, and the reason it hasn't caused it yet is that we had a lot of excess money supply that had been built up that had yet to be kind of deployed. So they could actually um, raid this resource, this armory, this arms depot, if you like, uh, of, of money um, and keep the, the show on the road. If you look at the actual reverse repo um, balances themselves, um, the money market funds put all their excess uh, money uh, into, into this area. They had about two and a half trillion dollars worth by uh, last summer. And since then, uh, Treasury has been basically um, only issuing T-bills. So uh, in 2022, Treasury issued something like $750 billion net of notes, um, uh, you know, of the two to ten year range. Last year, it retired forty billion. So that's a massive, you know, nearly eight hundred billion dollars of borrowing they didn't have to do in the two to ten year maturity range because they could just raid, the push on the open door of going to the money market funds and saying, "How much do we have to bid you to convince you to, to buy a T bill rather than keep your money on deposit at the Fed?" And those guys will move for a basis point. So they all they had to do was match and plus one basis point um, what was being paid on these deposits in the Fed, and the money market funds were pouring into it. So more than two trillion dollars have flowed out of that um, in pretty much six months. And so for the for so for you know Q3 2023, Q4 2024, and Q uh, uh, Q4. 2023 and Q1 2024 have all been funded by this lovely pile of um, idle cash that was sitting in the Fed's reverse repo. Because I think your, uh, your chart showing that deficit spending, uh, how I, we are just totally dependent, I mean, the economy in deficit spending. I don't think people realize that how much they've really been spending. Well, as you said at the top, you know, this isn't something that anyone else is really talking about. And I don't really know why they're not talking about it. Um, uh, everyone seems to be taking the GDP number and going, oh, phew, that was that was fine. We obviously got nothing to worry about. And I must admit, on the on the face of it, you would say, well, we nearly hit five percent annualized rate, you know, in the third quarter of 2023. No one's no one's seeing a, a nasty, sharp, abrupt halt coming when you've seen numbers like that. But the thing is that as soon as we run out of this money, um, which, as I say, is going to happen around about May uh, time, then um, Treasury can keep borrowing. They can keep spending. The difference is that until now, when they borrow money from uh, using T-bills um, from the reverse repo, this money is idle. In many respects, it's actually money. So it's only the, 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 um, the way the Fed measures money supply. They decide not to include. Um, they include some reverse repo, but, but not the stuff sitting in the, uh, or some money market funds, I should say, but not the reverse repo. We really you should include the reverse repo because that is actually idle money. It's, it's, it's sitting in the institutional equivalent of people's deposit accounts. <clears throat> and when you bring that money in, no other balance goes down. So you bring in the reverse repo and the treasury um, issues the T-bills and they get their bank account uh, goes up and then they send that money out to their employees in the form of salaries and their bank, uh, their bank account goes down. The treasuries does, and the, and the employees, federal employees' bank accounts go up, and that looks like new money supply. It's actually not; it's just the recycled old money supply that was sitting idle. But it looks like new money supply, and no, um, no areas had to suffer in order to boost uh, this spending. As soon as the re reverse repo runs out, though, treasury can still borrow money. Let's say it now decides to issue a five, ten-year note. It issues a five or ten-year note. Uh, takes that those uh, proceeds and, and pays them all to the employees and their bank accounts go up. But the problem is the people who bought those five or 10-year notes, their bank accounts went down. And this is the big difference, is the free lunch ends the moment the RRP is empty. And I think, uh, you know, you've talked about people not recognizing it. And I think, I think the government, people, you know, in the legislature, they know the problem, but it reminds me, uh, I was talking to a county judge about seven or eight years ago, 
about the runaway costs that they had for all the employees in the county. And I never will forget what he told me. He said, I said, well, uh, why, you can do something about it, right? And he said, well, yeah, you can do something about it if you don't want to be reelected. And that's basically where we are in the U.S. today. Well, you know, you say, I mean, everyone's got the same problem. I must admit, I mean, the U.S., the problem looks worse, temporarily at least, because, uh, as I said, you printed more money than we did. Um, that means you've got, you've got more um, more money for all the, the guys in, in, uh, uh, on the Capitol Hill to, to try and get their hands on. Um, so the, the, the ugly scramble for getting your hands on this money uh, was, you know, bigger and uglier and, and uh, more money changed hands uh, doing that. But we're about to go back to the, to the old fashioned rules, which is, you know, no free lunch. Uh, and the free lunch is, is nearly finished. We, we're left with a hangover, which is the, the inflation and the distortion to price levels that, that inflation has caused. If we had the sort of inflation they were talking about, you know, caused by uh, temporary disruptions to uh, supply channels, they were pretty careful not to mention this. But it, logically, price levels should have gone back down to where they came from. So after positive inflation, however transitory, we should have had deflation as those prices it went from 100 to 200, went back to 100. But they're staying at 200. <laughs> That's well, the problem. That's the bit they didn't really understand. So um, the thing that really leaps out at people, I think, um, is going to be the fact that uh, the US used to have um, quite a respectable low uh, debt to GDP. And that went ballistic uh, as a consequence of uh, uh, the GFC, the Great Financial Crisis. Uh, and then it went ballistic again um, as a consequence of the policy decisions um, to deal with COVID. Um, and now that's become, as so often with government, emergency measures then become normal measures. So now we've had this very big uh, recent surge of government debt, even in terms of GDP. So even as GDP has been recovering hugely post-COVID, uh, we've had this big uh, jump in, in debt that's even bigger. Uh, and this is this has occurred without any real crisis. Uh, if you if you have to um, borrow a lot of money to deal with a crisis, that's one thing, and leaves you with a, a legacy headache of having too much debt, and you hope that uh, you wouldn't have to pay too much interest on that debt uh, and eat into all sorts of other um, budget demands. But if you have a massive increase in uh, in debt with no crisis, um, you have to wonder what the what the economy would look like without that big surge in debt. And I think that's a really legitimate question to ask. And if you uh, subtract the increase in debt, um, then you get a negative nominal GDP if you sub subtract it from, from GDP. Uh, this is what one way of saying either that the debt is giving you way less than, a dollar of debt is giving you way less than a dollar of, of, of growth, uh, or without this deficit-funded debt, this, this money stolen from the future, we'd actually already be in recession. Um, the truth is probably a little bit of a mixture of the two, but basically the economy is not looking nearly as robust as the headline figures would tell you. Um, the, uh, um, the politicians are, are being dangerously irresponsible in borrowing and spending up a storm in the right to an election. Uh, who knew? Um, and uh, this really sort of, you know, is going to leave a, a, a massive headache. I mean, US debt now is, is pretty much at 100% of GDP. Uh, any more than 100% GDP, and you start being compared quite legitimately with countries like Italy. And um, I wanted to ask you this, James. You know, if you look at, uh, you know, when the when when the government uh, dev when the government debt was 17 trillion, uh, from 17 to 34, uh, I've got this information last week. Uh, the foreigners didn't buy that debt. It was all bought by U.S. either pension funds or people. The government, somebody bought it in the in the U.S. and which reminds me a bit of Japan. And you were an expert on Japan because that's where you started a lot of your research years ago. Does it remind you of Japan the way that's going? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I mentioned Italy. You mentioned Japan. In both of those are the famous large economies which have a massive amount of excess government debt to GDP, and that excess government debt. Um, we know that the, uh, the government is unproductive. In the private sector, if you're unproductive, you don't make a profit, you go bankrupt and you're gone. So we know that if you survive, the survivor bias in the private sector tells us that they're at least productive. Um, government has no such constraint. 
And given the fact that therefore government has no such constraint, we can say with confidence that government is unproductive. We just don't really ever know at any particular time how unproductive, um, but it isn't good. So if government um, borrows a lot of money to become a bigger and bigger part of the economy, then it's likely that we're going to have more and more of the economy unproductive. And sure enough, if you look at heavily indebted uh, countries like um, Italy and Japan, you have a terrible track record of growth. Um, these countries struggle to basically show any real growth at all. It's a little bit better in Japan, particularly if you look at it from a per capita point of view. Um, but it, it uh, on a headline basis, um, you know, Italy has actually shrunk uh, and Japan has, has hardly grown at all. And we're talking not just years here, but decades. And so this is a real um, issue for, for the US. Now, there's a there's a, a little known part of the of the Fed's research armory um, called R star, which is the natural rate of interest. Now, the natural rate of interest is the rate of interest that they estimate the um, the economy would be able to bear at kind of full employment without generating inflation. Put another way, they're really saying that this is the rate of interest that um, looks an awful lot like the long, the best estimate of the long term real growth rate. Now, if you look at the US, you look at that huge surge in debt, you would say, say uh oh, this means that it's likely to turn into an Italy or a, or a Japan, and the rate of growth that we can look forward to in the future must be a much, much lower. Well, the Fed's own calculations of R star tell you that, that R star, which used to be a, a trend growth rate in, in 1960 of 5%, is now not even 2%, it's 1%. So basically, the rise of government, the the um, the crowding out of the private sector. That's a, this is another phrase we're just not hearing enough of. We should be talking all the time about crowding out. But the crowding out of the private sector um, has basically reduced the long-term growth rate um, for America to something like about 1% according to the Fed. Most people might be a little bit more charitable. Well, this is interesting. This is the Fed's own researchers are telling you this. They're just they're just hiding it in the in the R star figure. Most people that uh, are around that remember crowding out, probably the last time they heard it was Economics 101. <laughs> and that's about the last time they saw it. Yeah, when they were probably being taught by someone who actually meant to mentioned Milton Friedman in a positive and, uh, and, and uh, supportive way, as opposed to what's happened. I mean, you know, we can have a whole new new show on, on sort of, you know, what the rise of models and, uh, uh, and things have done. And, and by putting mathematicians into economics, rather than the more kind of philosophical or legal type mind that thinks more about nuance, trade-offs, uh, gray areas, um, things like that. And, and uh, you know, this has done terrible damage to our, our beloved economics, but also it's done terrible damage to the economy, as you can see. Well, if you ask, I guess the question would be really, James, I would have for you. And, you know, there's two, there's two pieces of thought out there. Some people think that you're going to inflate so much that you just finally have this massive explosion and and the government finally has to do something about it because you have a train wreck. And others think that we go into um, this deflationary mode and and it, and that comes out of it as well. Uh, what 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 would you say to the people that think that, uh, hey, we're going to inflate more this decade. And I, I, I probably might be one of those, but it, it certainly seems like we've had more up and down. But what would you say to those people looking forward, you think, this next five to 10 years? First thing I would say is that uh, I'm going to, uh, to put a caveat here. Until now, everything I've talked about has happened. So I'm very confident about it. <laughs> you know, I can point to, the, to something which is on a chart, which is actually data that has happened uh, now you're asking me to to uh, um, get out my crystal ball. Uh, I always say that to clients when I'm talking to them about this, that you know I try not to ever say, and I think our industry is quite poor at this, to say something where I don't really have anything more um, more informative than the man in the pub uh, to to say things. But I'll tell you what I do think is going to happen. Um, but it's not a forecast. What I think is going to happen is that they're going to find um, that the economy surprisingly fast rolls over into something that looks surprisingly close to a deflationary recession. Uh, and if you want to know what that looks like, 
speeds, etc. Obviously, Europe is your is is exhibit A. Um, once they realise that, they'll go right. Okay, we've we've done enough. In fact, arguably more than enough. Don't forget, these guys specialise in being behind the curve. So by the time they realise that that they've brought inflation under control, uh, obviously they'll if inflation will be dangerously close to heading it sub zero. Um, and I say I expect them to cut rates. You look at the history of the U.S. and the speed with which it cuts rates. Um, you know, you can easily expect to see uh, two to four hundred basis points of cuts in a twelve-month period. You know, you know, massive you know rate cuts at every meeting, and not confined to just twenty-five basis points. They tend to cut hard and fast, but it's still never enough. You know, we still have to actually have the recession historically, and it can take a long time to pull the super tanker around because cutting rates. Even if you get rates to zero, you still probably have to wait several months before that actually feeds through. I'll give you an example. You know, bank lending started to uh, slow sharply as soon as um, the base rate got to 4%. Hit 4%, bank loan growth just plummeted. So, you know, you can cut rates in the US to 4% and confidently expect no improvement. You'd have to cut rates below 4% before you could really... Uh, expect the banks to uh, to increase lending, which is the beginning of turning the super tanker around, uh, etc. But the trouble is that therefore they'll probably cut hard and fast. They'll probably be frustrated in how slow the economy is to respond. Don't forget, you know, they they took ages to respond to the economy getting inflationary. Uh, then they did it too slow. By the time they've raised, you know, they've now raised rates, normal rates, way through the level of inflation, and now they're holding on. So they are always running behind, well behind the curve. But my suspicion is that after that, they then decide that QE, which was supposed to be a special circumstance crisis tool, but in their heads, I bet you is now just another tool. Um, I think they're going to wheel QE out again. And therefore, I think we are probably, if you look more than a year down the track, I think we probably are looking at entering a, a more permanent inflationary environment. And as you so rightly pointed out, um, you know, there aren't any foreigners interested in picking up treasury uh, debt any longer. Well, I think I was going to ask you, so what you could see, uh, which is what we sort of always thought would could happen, you never know, nobody knows, but one of the things you could see is that, you know, uh, you get into this deflation, they spook, and then they come in with the money, and here we go with another cycle again, which you called the last one perfectly. So I'm I'm assuming you could give us a heads up on this one. <laughs> uh, absolutely, I mean I'll be I will be monitoring that uh, very closely. But the the interesting thing is that you can you know uh, fool me once uh, you know uh, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. So there's the bond market that's going. You know I've seen these guys prove that they don't really know what they're talking about and or what they're doing when it comes to printing money. And I've seen them deploy QE when it really wasn't necessary. You know, the first time they deployed QE, it was necessary in inverted commas because uh, the banking system uh, lost a trillion dollars of charge offs after all recoveries and had to raise a further $500 billion to uh, supplement its capital base. So therefore, you had $1.5 trillion that the, uh, that the banking system was destroying. Now, uh, that took six years. And over that six-year period, QE was $3.75 trillion, but actually only $2.8 trillion of it, um, for technical reasons, went into money supply. So the increase in money supply from the great financial crisis QE was only about approximately $1 trillion dollars spread out over six years. So it was about 200 billion or less a year. $200 billion or less of money printing a year works out at something like 2% or less than 2% uh, money supply growth. Nothing. Did they learn from this? No, they did not. So when it came to COVID, they went nuts. And so, so the next time that they try and inflate a perfectly normal environment where there isn't a banking crisis with QE, I think you're going to get the treasury market. We will sit down. And, and another phrase we haven't heard for a very long time is bond market vigilantes. I think you're going to get the bond market vigilantes sitting down and saying, right, well, we used to give them benefit of the doubt. So in, before the great financial crisis, the average premium that a 10-year treasury commanded over the 10-year uh, CPI was nearly 300 basis points. 
Now, the 10-year CPI at the moment is about 2.3%. So if you add 300 basis points to that as your average Treasury 10-year yield, you're talking about, uh, obviously, five, nearly 5.5% five yield. And by the way, that average, it often it went higher when interest uh, inflation was actually at the time trending up. So I think that the Treasury market, if they try and pull this stunt again, I think the Treasury market will be brutal. One of the one of the big things we we get questions all the time from business people is, hey, I have to do a financing on something or I've got some money. You know, I've got a financing coming due. What do you think we should do? You know, should we should we extend that duration to finance this piece of equipment or whatever or this building or should we keep it short? Uh, and I think that's a big question for businesses today. But if if you were looking at that, how how would you how would you respond to that from a business person? Well, the, um, the I think that the obvious implications of of what I've been saying um, are that the economy is going to um, be much worse by the end of the year than people think it's going to be. Um, then we so we so we kind of know what will happen at the short end. The short end's a bit of a given. At some stage, the Fed's going to go into a panic that, oh, my God, we shouldn't just be cutting. We should have been cutting for months now. And they'll be falling over themselves to try and get, uh, you know, I say ahead of, but I'm only being charitable, um, to not appear too far behind the curve as usual. Um, and we'll get short rates coming down super fast. But at some stage, in order to pull the super tanker out of the dive, to mix my metaphors, um, they're going to be looking at not just cutting rates, but but maybe, um, you know, um, resuscitating QE and bringing that um, back out of uh, out of hibernation. And if they do that, I think that will be a very uh, they, they labor under the illusion that QE caused rates to go down. This is because Bernanke said it would. He said if we buy. Uh, long dated securities will push the price up and will push the yield down. And when he first launched QE, he was basically trying to uh, manipulate the housing market. So he was doing MBS only. Um, and, and that's what he thought would happen. But if you actually look at what has happened, despite all the, the Fed research, during QE, the actual periods that they were doing QE, yields all shot up. And in the inter QE periods, yields all collapsed. Because without QE, we were going into a deflationary death spiral. But the only asset that was worth holding was a long dated treasury. With QE, suddenly it was looking more inflationary. Maybe we wouldn't go into death spiral. Maybe the positive feedback loops wouldn't kick in, in which case, yikes, I've got far too little risk out there. And everybody moved out of treasuries and into risk. So um, there's a big risk, as far as I'm concerned, that if they do QE again, they will think that they're doing it to get bond yields at the long end down. And the actual response will be the exact opposite, because the market will be saying. That's the way we felt about it. The bond market would take over and say, hey, we don't care what you think you're going to do. This is what we think is going to happen. And I might wind up with this. I'll just ask your opinion. But we felt like for the rest of the decade that if you were going to own bonds, you probably need to know how to trade them. Because if you just want to buy and hold something for the next 20 years, you could really be into a mess here. What do you think about that? Well, as I said, historically, people were very happy to buy and hold a 10-year treasury, if, um, except they were worried, of course, about how much inflation would erode down. And since you can't know the future, uh, you, they had a look at what the 10-year historic inflation rate was and used that as their uh, as their the amount that they have the value eroded, and they'd ask for an inflation buffer of, of 300 basis points. So my advice for a buy and hold is um, look up the 10-year CPI, which, as I said, I think it right now is about 2.3%. Add 300 basis points and say to HM, oh, not HM government, <laughs> uh, say to the US Treasury, offer me 5.3% on a 10-year, and, and I'll buy it and lock it away. Any less than that, I'm not playing. Right. So and I think that's what the, the bond market will do. Now, obviously, we have we have short term cycles and the near term cycle is the economy is going to start disappointing. And therefore, I think there's a very interesting trade here for, for bond investors. But if you're talking about the guys who are locking in for 10 years, yeah, they're going to demand a much higher premium, I think. So uh, last question, James, and that is 
if you look at the 34 trillion debt the U.S. has today, where are we headed here? I mean, is there a point where you know, they can't finance or is there a point where uh, the, you know, they, they push out so much money that the growth rate even goes under 1%? How, how do you see that playing out? Sadly, there, there is actually quite a lot of history of this. And if any of your viewers are interested, uh, dust off your old copy of uh, This Time is Different um, by Rogoff and uh, Reinhardt. Uh, but basically speaking, if you're a private sector company, so this tells you everything about debt and the, pub, the government versus private sector. If you're a private sector company and you've got too much debt, you basically go under and um, you know your, your creditors um, divvy up your, your assets. If you're a public sector and you have too much debt, then you default, but you default by inflation. In other words, you pay. You look to pay back in something that's um, that looks the same but isn't the same as the thing you borrowed in. So um, you know, one of the things that one of the things that maybe was uh, instrumental in in helping because a lot of it, uh, some of the shocks were exogenous in terms of oil, etc. But one of the things which helped make the inflationary period, the sort of sixties, uh, seventies, and eighties inflationary, was that that was the tail end of the huge debts that built up during the the, the Second World War. Um, then we had the you know disinflationary period, and we had um, debt was super low, and it all looked, with the benefit of hindsight, really good. But then, of course, you know everyone started getting slack. Particularly politicians started getting slack, and they started borrowing again. So you know now we've just had another massive um, debt bubble. Their way of getting out of it is a generation, probably, of inflation, um, and uh, until that it's been inflated away. So they'll have to run, you know, reasonable, reasonably small primary deficits, but they're going to have to deal with that interest problem by um, by keeping things inflationary, which, as I said, means for a bond investor, don't accept anything without that big 300 plus premium of yield. And for everyone else, uh, it, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a, those aren't as good years to live through, um, but they can be very good from the economy from a certain point of view. The young, the young are brutalized by low interest rates, high um, uh, low mortgage rates cause high property values, which keep them out of the property market uh, and, and disincentivize everything. And, it, and an inflationary environment is only really good for someone who has something that they can sell at a higher um, inflation rate than, than um, overall inflation. And that tends to be young people and their labor. So the one good thing we could see out of this is it might be great for our kids. No, it's going to be terrible for us. Well, I'm... <laughs> I'm going to ask you this question and we'll finish, but I'm as, the takeaway I get from this is if you're buying bonds, don't get too hung up on uh, some sort of deflationary pressures over the next 12 to 18 months because the long-term picture will throw you if that's the case. And maybe I'm interpreting that wrong, but if I'm interpreting it right, I'd like to hear it from you. Well, I mean, you know, uh... Personally speaking, I, I think the bonds, uh, bond uh, investors will probably do pretty well as we go into the, you know, uh, reveal the fact the economy is not looking good and the Fed goes through its its uh, aggressive rate cutting. But at some stage before, maybe even before the Fed reach, reaches the bottom in terms of its near term rate cutting, bond investors uh, should be thinking where we're going next and probably thinking, you know, it's time for me to bail and I'll come back when there's a really much bigger um, yield on offer than the one that we've got at the moment. And that's, uh, that's, that's the reason I say that is because a lot of practitioners in investment business today have, have only been around 15, 20 years and they don't know how to trade bonds. You know, they, it's a buy and hold on a 25, 30 year old, 30 year bond. Hey, everything's okay. I think that will be proven wrong. I'm, sounds like you sort of agree with me in that respect, but James, I want to tell you, listen, I know, uh, we're probably getting into uh, nighttime for you there almost, but but I want to thank you. You've been really, really interesting today. And um, I would encourage people because we'll list this during this during this uh, conversation. You'll see us listed a few times about how they can get in contact with Macro Strategy. And I'm assuming uh, uh, we'll have the website on there too, but um, since I've taken your service, I know how well you you print and what you say. I would encourage people to take a look at you, James. Well, thank you very much. I'll leave you with one um, quick thing. I'd have to read books, old books, to see what you know the world was like. And Burton Malkiel, the 
uh, the author, uh, famously, of A Random Walk Down Wall Street. Yeah. He wrote a book um, about encouraging people to invest uh, to beat the inflation in uh, uh, in the 70s. He was, uh, it was, I think it was 79 or so that he wrote it. He was a bit early because 82 was the bottom for shares. Um, but his argument was was fairly sound. But there's a lovely line in that book where he says, um, you know, now, sure, if you want to sleep well at night, you can always buy a money market fund at 13 and a half percent but if you really want to make good money i'm i don't think you should start thinking about equity and you know you're going seriously you know it was considered too dull to buy a 13 and a half percent money market fund you know things can change and they can change a lot <laughs> yeah they sure can well listen uh james so glad to have you with us today and uh, we will certainly hopefully we can have you back next year to talk with us again that's my pleasure. All right. Thanks. See you again. Bye. Hello, everyone. I just want to say if you like this video and you want to see more of this type of information, because we really try to get the information that you don't see from anybody else, then be sure and click on subscribe and you'll see more of what we do here at Oxbow.